It's June 27, 1997. Backstage at the Sylvia and Danny Kay Playhouse, and, and it's sound check time, and we're projecting backwards in time. I'm, I'm sitting with a legendary producer of this music, George Avakian. It is so good to see you. It's, all, it's always good to see you, and it's been far too long. I hate to think how long it's been since we've been together, and I, I know it was up in uh, uh, the St. Paul, Minneapolis area when my sister was living there long ago. Well, George, you're um, projecting a program tonight from this stage that covers uh, some lost treasures, and right. I wanted to ask you primarily how, how did this project form? Well, it was uh, an unexpected uh, twist. Uh, first of all, I should, I guess, explain briefly that uh, we're playing, uh, or rather the musicians are playing the music of uh, Armstrong and Beiderbecke, which uh, the public never got to hear for the most part. I'll explain that later. I got wind of uh, a rumor many years ago, I think it was about 1992, that Louis Armstrong had uh, copyrighted a lot of compositions and uh, then forgotten all about them. I was surprised because, I, you know, I was a very close friend of Louis. He used to hang out at his house and we'd talk until uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. Never mentioned it. So I uh, went to the uh, executor of the uh, Armstrong estate, David Gold, and uh, we're good friends, you know, since the old days, and uh, said, uh, can you get me a list of everything that Louis ever copyrighted? And he said, sure. Well, on the list, were a number of titles that I didn't recognize, so uh, I decided to uh, ask the Library of Congress if the uh, lead sheets still existed. Now, a lead sheet is a piece of music paper on which the composer writes out the uh, music, note by note, you know, and then the harmony underneath usually, and you attach this to a, an application form for copyright and, very important, a check. And that gets preserved, presumably, for all time. So. Uh, I found out that I have to get a letter of permission from the estate, which David furnished, and the search began. Finally, eight compositions turned up from the list of 18. And to make a long story short, one of them got disqualified because, unexpectedly, uh, the French RCA company found that Louis had recorded a master of that song and they released it, so it was no longer unknown, as it were. And the uh, other thing that happened was not so cheerful. We never found any of the other ten pieces. The Library of Congress says they may still be here because things get misfiled and, and uh, they turn up in, uh, in a box in a closet and that sort of thing. So we're hoping. Now, as soon as I, I found out about the seven, I went to uh, Winton Marsalis and said, hey, Winton, how about this, if we can get a, as many as uh, 15, 16, 17 unknown Armstrong compositions. It's a natural for a concert and a CD. He said, let's go. But we never got enough pieces. In the meantime, I knew that uh, various researchers were uh, digging into the files and, uh, uh, for all sorts of uh, uh, odds and ends at the Library of Congress. And I got concerned that uh, uh, somebody might uh, uh, find uh, some of this music and decide to uh, uh, perform and record it, we'll say, with uh, uh, amateurs, such as in a college, you know, that sort of thing which would be a shame. It should be done by professionals and done correctly in the uh, style of the period. Uh, right here now on the, uh, on the stage, we have uh, a young fellow, uh, uh, you just met him as a matter of fact, named David Oswald, who is not a, a household name, but he's an unusual person. He's a young attorney, a, a very a fine real estate lawyer, works full time at the job, but he's also a classically trained tuba player who adores Louis Armstrong and jazz, knows more about Louis than I do, never met Louis because he's too young. And he has formed over the last, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years, there's David right there, uh, a group that he calls the Gully Low Jazz Band, named after Louis' famous uh, uh, Gully Low Blues. And he uses a floating personnel of the finest musicians. Randy is one of them, and tonight we have Howard Alden, who's a, a one of those guys, and Pep Pep uh, Peplowski who uh, is playing clarinet tonight and tenor saxophone. And uh, uh, I suggested that let's play it safe and get a couple of these Armstrong compositions performed at a, a small, very uh, 
a chic concert up near my home in Riverdale. Basically, those were uh, classical music concerts, but the uh, director, Mort Mort Frank, Mortimer Frank, who's uh, uh, also the uh, uh, curator of the uh, Toscanini Archive and so on, he, he likes jazz. He went to hear David play uh, uh, downtown in New York, and he said, look, let's do a concert with uh, this group. They can only afford four men. Usually it's uh, uh, seven men or so. But the quartet came, and they played these two pieces of uh, uh, 1923, uh, when Armstrong was with the Oliver Band, and they're the first two pieces on the program. And uh, it was rather sensational. Uh, Gary Giddens of the Village Voice covered it and gave us a great review. And New York One, which is a around-the-clock news uh, television cable station in New York, covered it and decided to make me the New Yorker of the week for having done this. And they ran about a 12-minute uh, uh, segment about the uh, whole idea with interviews with David and Randy and myself and Mort. And they ran it every second hour on the even-numbered hours for 36 hours. <laughs> that's, that's the way they, they did it. I don't think they do it anymore. Well, when I told Randy, uh, who wrote uh, a sketch arrangements for the performance, uh, that I was still hoping to find these other compositions, he said, look, if you never find them, I have an idea. I said, What's that, I said. He said, uh, look, I'm, I'm on the trail of uh, some interesting stuff involving Bix, and Bix and Louie were the closest of friends, first interracial uh, mutual admiration society in the history of jazz. And could be half Louis, half Bix, and the type of material I have in mind fits in with what you got with Louis. And what it was was this: he knew of five arm, of five compositions which uh, had been recorded by Bix, not composed by him, and the masters had been destroyed. They cover various periods of his life, you know, from uh, the first Bix and his rhythm jugglers session to uh, Goldcat and uh, Frank Trombauer and so on. Uh, by the way, that's the beginning of uh, the Armstrong composition, uh, Papa, What You Are Trying to Do to Me, I've Been Doing It For Years. And that's the title. No, no uh, punctuation. Novelty song. Well, uh, he said, uh, I could write arrangements in the style of the bands that uh, played the uh, destroyed master records that nobody's ever heard. And then... Uh, Dick Hyman knows of a couple of uh, compositions of uh, uh, Bix's that uh, are totally forgotten. So I said, let's go. And we uh, uh, talked to uh, Winton Marsalis, who at this point was getting so busy he couldn't handle uh, a concert himself because he's booked into 1999. And uh, uh, Winton and uh, Randy and I went to see George Ween and said, look, it's impossible to do anything at Lincoln Center. How about putting this on the JVC series? He said, let's go, let's do it. And here we are. By the way, I hope people can hear me because the music is great. But on the other hand, maybe they shouldn't hear me. The music is better. Well, it's sound check time and we're looking at the clock and it's about, oh, a little less than, or a little more than two hours to curtain time. And are, are we ready? We are. <laughs> uh, thanks again. It was a real pleasure. I, uh, we haven't uh, been together in so, so long a time. It was like uh, it was yesterday.